Well, welcome to the 700 Club, a major shift in the war against Hamas. Israel has pulled out a key division from southern Gaza. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu declared that victory is a step away. Yesterday marked six months since the October 7th Hamas invasion. Hostage families gathered together in Jerusalem and Washington, D.C. to demand the release of their loved ones. CBN's Chris Mitchell has more. Israel's defense minister, Yoav Gallant, says the pullout is a sign that Hamas is severely weakened as a fighting force. Hamas ceased to function as a military organization throughout the Gaza Strip. But within an hour, Hamas terrorists were firing rockets at seven Israeli communities from the area the IDF troops had just left. On the tactical level, what you can read into it is that the IDF is pulling out troops in order to get them some rest and time to reorganize in order to be prepared for the next stage of missions. That's one way of looking at it. Jonathan Canricus, a former IDF spokesman and a lieutenant colonel in the reserves, says that next stage of mission would be an invasion of Rafa. He also says the move can be seen as a result of American pressure. There was a few days ago an important and reportedly heated conversation between the president and the prime minister, and uh, demands were made, and you could think that what Israel is doing now is an implementation of those demands. Kenrika says the IDF is also preparing for a greater conflict with Hezbollah. Time will have to tell and we will have to wait which one of the options it was, but it could be either one or a combination of all. Still, as fighting reaches the six-month mark, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu sees the elimination of Hamas just ahead. We're marking today six months of war. We're one step away from victory. Netanyahu and Gallant insist on an invasion of Rafa, where Hamas's last intact battalions are holding up. As it has for weeks, the White House disagrees. All I can do is say what I said before. We don't support a major ground operation in Rafa. That has not changed. And we're looking forward to having conversations with the Israelis about alternatives to those kinds of operations. Some families of hostages held in Gaza mark the six-month anniversary of their captivity at demonstrations in Washington and Jerusalem. Hostage mother Rachel Goldberg Poland told CBS Face the Nation she's in D.C. to find what more can be done to free the hostages. What levers need to be pulled in order to make this happen? Because six months is actually a complete failure on everybody's part, and we are feeling extreme desperation, despair. Netanyahu says his government won't buckle to international pressure on a ceasefire without freedom for the hostages. I made it clear to the international community there will be no ceasefire without the return of hostages. It just won't happen. Chris Mitchell, CBN News, Jerusalem. Uh, for all those calling for ceasefire, pay attention to what Hamas just did. Israel said we're withdrawing one of our, uh, one of our divisions. What a, a significant move, whether that's a ta tactical move to um, have them have a period of rest and rearming. Are they preparing for a war against Hezbollah? All of these things are, are playing into this decision. But in that withdrawal, you would think Hamas would say, okay, Israel's withdrawing, and, and that's a good sign. What do they do? They go into that area and start firing rockets at Israel. So all this talk about ceasefire, all this talk about innocent lives, all of this, please, can Hamas stop firing rock, rockets? That's number one. Number two, can they release the hostages? Can they send them home? What is the strategic advantage at this point, as if there was ever one? It's a war crime to take civilians hostage. That's an absolute international war crime. I'm not hearing anybody talk about that in all of this discussion of ceasefire. So please, can Hamas, the pressure, be put there and not on Israel? Israel has enough pressure going on right now. And let me add to what Netanyahu is obviously carrying the burden of all of this. His own Minister of National Security has said, if there isn't an invasion of Rafah, if Hamas isn't totally defeated, 
then the prime minister isn't going to have a government. The coalition will absolutely dissolve. So there's politics in the United States. There's international politics. There's all kinds of pressure coming from the UN, other groups. But please keep the very clear moral picture. Hamas started this. Hamas has hostages. Hamas continues to fire rockets at Israel. What in the world do you expect Israel to do in response? They have to stop this. That's part of their national defense. It's their right of self-preservation. They can't help but do this. Well, here at home, the war in Gaza could play a decisive role in the presidential election. John Jessup has more on that story from the CBN Newsroom. John? That's right, Gordon. We're just about seven months away from Election Day, and right now the 2024 race is seen as too close to call. The U.S. relationship with Israel is one issue that could tip the balance. CBN chief political analyst David Brody explains why. Navigating how he handles the war in Israel is getting tougher for Joe Biden, not only as president, but also in his quest to win re-election. A consistent outcry by his party's progressive wing is getting louder and larger, pushing for action against Israel for what they call a genocide in Gaza. Following the recent tragedy involving aid workers, the Biden administration took a stronger tone, calling on Israel to take concrete steps to end the humanitarian suffering or else. If there's no changes to their policy and their approaches, then there's going to have to be changes to ours. The question of how far those changes go is key because Biden is trailing in the polls. A drastic shift against Israel could further fracture the Democrats' base, putting key swing states at risk in November. For example, the number of Democrats choosing uncommitted over Biden in key swing state primaries has been jarring. It began in February with Michigan at roughly 13 percent, then almost 19 percent in Minnesota. This month, 8 percent in Wisconsin. Rick Klein is political director for ABC News. He needs Michigan. And uh, I tell you what, at the mar this election seems, at least in those Rust Belt states, they're going to be one at the margins. Yeah, I think that's right, David. And look, Michigan is a little less close than some of the other uh, battleground states, 150,000 votes or so. Uh, but more than, you know, almost almost more than 100,000 people voted uncommitted in, in the primary. So if a big chunk of them decide to stay home or, or vote Donald Trump, um, then you start to, to see a, a real difference. Joe Biden really can't become president if he doesn't win, in, win Michigan. Later this month comes Pennsylvania, which has the country's fourth largest Jewish population. Middle East analyst Jake Novak spent time as media director for the Israel consulate in New York. If there's any state in the country where the Jewish vote actually means something, it's Pennsylvania. Since it has about 3% of the voting population, Biden will need to perform a political tap dance between progressives and Jewish Democrats in Pennsylvania and similar states. The biggest problem is that he's trying to dance at two weddings. That's an old Yiddish phrase. And you can't do that. On the Republican side, Donald Trump is also weighing in. As president, he took a strong pro-Israel stance throughout his term, although recent comments about quickly ending the war have raised eyebrows. What I said very plainly is get it over with and let's get back to peace and stop killing people. I'm not sure that I'm loving the way they're doing it because you got to have victory. Israel is absolutely losing the PR war. Trump has certainly had a reputation of being very, very strongly pro-Israel, but you're right. Some of the comments he's made have, have made people question whether that's an un, un, you know, an unending commitment or if there's limitations to that. Even with his isolationist views, there's little thought that Trump will push too far against the Jewish state. And my expectation is you're not going to hear a lot of kind of public criticism from Trump toward Netanyahu. There's no real upside in that. At the end of the day, Israel and, and, and Jewish people and, and Christians who support Israel know that Donald Trump has Israel's back. Some aren't so confident that progressive Democrats will have Biden's back. Could it cost Biden the election if it's close? Well, it, it's very likely to be a very close election. In that sense, almost everything could be the, dis, the, the difference maker. But it's very easy to see a scenario where this is uh, a defining issue. And uh, when the history of the 2024 election is written, that this is uh, among the factors that uh, determine its outcome. David Brody, CBN News, Washington. All right. Thank you, David. Well, for a little while today, Americans will turn their eyes from politics and world affairs and look to the heavens instead. 
Millions have traveled along a narrow corridor stretching from Mexico to Canada to see a total eclipse of the sun. CBN still heard as a story. It's North America's biggest eclipse audience ever. Thanks to the densely populated path it will take across the U.S. and all the social media buzz surrounding it. We've been talking about coming here for this event since, what, three months before she was born? In the zone of totality, a four-hour trek stretching from Texas all the way to Maine and 115 miles wide, the darkness will last up to four and a half minutes. Temperatures will drop as much as 10 degrees. So many visitors have traveled to see the phenomenon roads could be clogged and some areas have declared a state of emergency because of all the visitors. But whatever you do, don't try to view the eclipse without the proper eye protection. Looking at the sun with the naked eye is incredibly dangerous. The sun's UV radiation is capable of destroying the soft tissue in the back of your eyeballs. I got the uh, certified safety eyewear. I got UV filters for my camera. Almost everyone in North America will be guaranteed at least a partial eclipse, weather permitting. Unfortunately, some areas could only see clouds. The best weather is expected in New England and Canada. They do have weather concerns, but I'm really hopeful that we're going to have a very good experience. It's going to be disappointing, definitely, if it's cloudy. The timing and location of this particular eclipse has some reading biblical and prophetic significance. The fact that it goes over seven cities called Nineveh and one called Jonah makes you wonder, is this our Nineveh moment, America, a time to reflect on where we stand on a lot of issues. The next total solar eclipse in 2026 will only be seen over the Atlantic and in Spain. Alaska will have one in 2033, and the next chance for the lower 48 won't come for another 20 years. Dale Hurd, CBN News. Good little while. Thank you, Dale. Well, for the second time in three years, the light is shining on the University of South Carolina women's basketball team. The Gamecocks beat Iowa 87-75 to in last night's championship game, capping off an undefeated 38-win season. Iowa phenom Caitlin Clark, who finishes her career as college basketball's all-time leading scorer, denied a national championship. Tonight, the men's title game features returning champions UConn against the Purdue Boilermakers. The Huskies aiming to become the first team to win back-to-back -back championships in 17 years. You can be sure to watch tomorrow's 700 Club for our coverage of the game from Glendale, Arizona. And for Caitlin Clark, the end of a phenomenal college career. The tiny town of Eagle Pass, Texas, is a top destination for migrants crossing the border illegally. The surge is putting a huge strain on the local community from longer hospital waits to delays in public services. It's also taking a major toll on the city's firefighters. Heather Sells reports. In recent years, Eagle Pass firefighters have become all too familiar with the Rio Grande, from the river's unpredictable twists and turns to its sudden drop-offs and deadly undertow. This river is very treacherous. The, the water is very swift. For these first responders, the border crisis is ever-present, and calls to help migrants have spiked in the last year. They've resulted in more than 700 border crossers transported to the ER and drained the department's budget by up to $20,000 a day. For these seasoned firefighters, however, the worst part is recovering bodies. You see children, you see infants. Uh, one image that, that doesn't go away that I got to see is a two-month-old, eyes half open. Uh, his face, his mouth, his ears full of mud. Over this last year alone, we've encountered uh, close to um, a drowning every shift. Chief Manuel Mello drove us to one spot heavily used by migrants. The trail of discarded clothes and antibiotics point to a desperate journey that includes physical hardship and sexual assault. What baffles Mello and other firefighters, though, is why the migrants choose crossing the river rather than an official port of entry. I think that they believe that it's quicker for them to get processed than to having 
to go through the ports of entry and asking for asylum and waiting maybe a week, maybe two to get their paperwork and cross over. They'd rather risk their lives and cross through the river. The fire department has added an ambulance and rescue boat to keep up with demand. First one of the day. Still, tensions grow when migrant and local city calls overlap, forcing the town's different stations to cover each other's zones. We're in the river dealing with, uh, uh, with whatever incident and calls are still happening. And this city is depending on us to be there. On the water, firefighters try to be ready for any emergency, be it medical, rescue, or recovery. They've also become familiar with various authorities, including area border patrol, authorities on the Mexican side, the state's control of the city's Shelby Park, and patrols from as far away as Florida. And they've come to learn how the Rio Grande can take a life. The river can be deceptive in so many ways. Sometimes border crossers will make it to what they think is the other side, but in reality, it's an island and there's still deeper waters to cross on the other side. We're tired. The community is tired. Crime has gone up. Death is something that we're seeing every day. And it's very easy to watch something and, and make them make an opinion, right? But I'm telling you right now, it's it's been pretty bad for all of us. Chief Mello is well aware that pulling bodies from the river takes a toll, especially when his folks must recover children. They can relate that to their families. These are young guys um, between the ages of 22 and 40 years old. So they've got small children, the older guys, uh, over 40, well, they've got grandkids and they can relate with their grandkids. It's why he's applying now for mental health grants to sustain a workforce that must continue and perhaps be prepared to do more. The citizens of Eagle Pass are compassionate in a way, but they're also mad. They're mad because we were getting all this negative attention. And uh, I guess they all hope, like I do, that someday soon this will all go away. Firefighters here are prepared to see an increase in the number of migrants crossing the river this spring, as has been the pattern for the last several years. They are also hoping for new policies that will deter people who are coming over from crossing the river. Reporting in Eagle Pass, Texas, Heather Sell, CBN News. Well, that's a story you're not going to see anywhere else, and it's the cost, of the, and it's a horrible cost that's happening to the border communities, but it's also happening to those poor migrants. Here they are trying to get a better life, trying to get ahead, and it's interesting that they have these networks of communications that say if you try to cross the most dangerous way possible, try to swim the Rio Grande. If you, if you cross that way, then your processing is going to be quicker. If you try to go across at a border crossing, you're going to be delayed. But if you do it illegally, if you do it this way, then when you get through, there'll be quicker processing, and then you'll get released into the United States. This is a direct result of the current administration's policy. They put out a welcome mat on our southern border. They did it for political reasons. They ran on it. I'm not a defender of what happened under Attorney General Sessions where migrant families were separated at the border. That should have never happened. But at the same time, when you put a welcome mat out and you send that message around the world, that you can cross into the United States. If you get caught, it's not a big deal. You get processed and then you get put out on the street in the United States. If that's the message we're sending to the world, is there any wonder there's a crisis? Uh, it, it makes no sense to me that you wouldn't enforce the immigration laws. You know, it's not popular to say illegal immigrant, but that's exactly what's happening. These are illegal crossings. And the, you have to enforce the laws that are currently on the book. And you can't blame it and play politics all over again that if Congress could just give me the authority, we could shut down the border today. You have that authority. You can enforce the border. 
you have chosen to not enforce it, and you've done it for political reasons. And here is the terrible human cost. The, the cost financially for these border towns, you hear a lot when Chicago says we can't afford it. You hear a lot when New York says we can't afford it. You hear a lot when, you know, a plane load gets dropped off at Martha, Martha's Vineyard. You, you, that gets national news. But the daily wear and tear on a border community, the incredible financial cost. But here's the biggest cost. Little children drowning in a river, all because of a governmental policy. It makes no sense. Please stop it. Please enforce the law. Please shut down the border. Please tell people around the world, no, you can't cross. If you do cross, we're going to put you back on the other side. You're not going to get some easy process here. Uh, we are going to enforce our current law. Last year, the Purdue Boilermakers were bounced in the first round of the NCAA tournament. Well, now they're one win away from taking the championship. Standing in their way, the UConn Huskies. They're gunning for their second straight title. Will Dawson brings us more from Phoenix, Arizona. Well, we're here in Phoenix for tonight's championship matchup between really what has been the best two college basketball teams all season long, Purdue and UConn. But before that can happen, I had a chance to talk with players from all four teams. And one thing is clear, parents and grandparents who instill godly principles into their children leave a lasting impact. And all the players I spoke with were happy to talk about just that. Growing up, you know, I mean, I wasn't, you know, too much heavily in church, but, you know, my mom, you know, she always, you know, always, you know, prayed with me, um, for me. Um, my grandma, you know, she, you know, she always instilled that into me, having the faith that I have and, you know, just continuing to, to spread it, you know, with everybody else, you know, supporting me as well. I mean, it's just been, you know, unbelievable to be where I'm at today. I'm still like, I grew up in a church. My mom always instilled that into me. And then it's just been a blessing to just be here and, um, I mean, obviously, like, I give all my glory and honor to the Lord because without him, I wouldn't be here today. And um, I just thank him for it. And I mean, like, even through my, like, trials and tribulations, he's always stuck with me. So just being able to have him on my side wherever I go, I know, like, that nothing is impossible for me. I'm nowhere without God, and um, it'll be like that for the rest of my life. It, it wasn't a, you know, one-time thing. It's, it's meant that since I was born, you know, my parents instilled God in, into me uh, as a child and, you know, I carry that faith and belief to this day. NC State forward DJ Burns has captivated the sports world through the unlikely Final Four appearance by the Wolfpack and his unmatched joy because of his faith, a faith he says he learned by example from his late grandfather. Yeah, um, that's just something my grandfather instilled in me. You know, he passed it on along to me and my sister, and that's just something that we took with him. Like, you know, it's one of those things where if you don't remember anything else, that's what you'll remember from him. Alabama guard Davin Cosby Jr.'s world was rocked when he lost his father two years ago. However, his dad's legacy lives on through the Bible he gifted his son, inscribed with the verse Jeremiah 29 11. You know, ever since he passed, like, that's what I've been, you know, more focused on, just trying to, you know, basketball is my goal, but also he destined it for me. So it's like, I just want to make him proud, and I know he's still watching, and I know I'm making him proud while he's watching down on me. A favorite Bible verse for NC State guard Casey Morsell is James 1.17. Every good and perfect gift is from above. All of the, the blessings that you receive all come from the man above. And uh, I think that that Bible verse means way more along our journey, um, just because our, our faith was definitely tested. Um, our belief was definitely tested along this ride, uh, you know, even throughout the season not getting the results that we wanted, um, and still just believing, still coming in, just working, getting after it every day. Um, and then the shine, I guess, in the, in the, the new season or the postseason, like, it, I mean, it, 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 that verse, I mean, it, it's definitely, it's on display with this team. You know, this life that we're living is temporary, but at the end of the day, um, our faith and our, and our salvation, that's the one eternal thing that reigns above all. Knowing that, you know, it, at least for me, you know, my joy is not based on, you know, the present circumstances, whether it's um, good or bad, whatever it may be, but rather it's based on, you know, eternity and, and our salvation. Yeah, I mean, I have it on my, my arm right here, trust in the Lord with all your heart. 
lean on with your own understanding and all your ways acknowledge him and he shall direct your path so i mean if i stay in that word and um trust that he has whatever he has for me i mean like i'll just let his will be done and i'll let him finish that off for me UConn coach Dan Hurley has the Huskies back in the championship game after winning it all last year. Win or lose, he finds comfort in his relationship with Jesus. You know, for me, when I get back in the locker room after, uh, you know, a great victory, I, I find uh, just a couple minutes to pray, uh, you know, to, 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 to pray to God and, and to be grateful and thankful for giving, giving me and you know, the, the team is strength, And then uh, when you're going through the struggles, too, you, it's the faith, your faith in God uh, that gets you through the tough times. So whether it's good times or bad times, you know, your, your faith in, in, in Jesus Christ is, is what's going to be your rock. I hope your takeaway from that piece is every single one is giving glory to God. When, when you look at the upper echelons of pretty much anything in life, you'll find Christians because they have faith to believe that God is with them, that the world is not a, is, is not a, a, a huge enemy, that God will overcome every obstacle in their life. All they have to do is have faith in Him. And regardless of whether they win or lose, they know their eternal destiny. And with that, and with that in mind, they're able to go through life and go through life remarkably successful. Ha having this kind of faith is a game changer for anyone in any profession, in anything that you do. I still have the words of Don Staley in my head from yesterday, where the first thing after this incredible win and and you know here she is the coach of the South Carolina game. They just won a national title. What does she want to do? She wants to give glory to God. That's the first thing she wants to do. And then she wants to honor the opposition. She wants to call, specifically talk about Caitlin Clark and what she's done for the sport and her exciting future. One of the things that she has as her motto, the disciplined life can do anything. Isn't that incredible? If you apply the same principles that with God, all things are possible, I'm going to pursue him every day. I'm going to do what he tells me to do. I'm going to do it with all of my strength and all of my heart. I'm going to follow after him. Well, then wonderful things will open up for you. You can't help but succeed when God is on your side. Welcome back to the 700 Club for the CBN News Break. Former President Donald Trump is not supporting a national law restricting abortion. In a video released on social media, the presumptive Republican nominee for president says the issue should be left to the states, saying, quote, whatever they decide must be the law of the land, in this case, the law of the state. He also did not send a number of weeks in a pregnancy when abortion should be outlawed. Well, CBN Animation Superbook has surpassed 2 billion lifetime views on YouTube. Top regions impacted include Latin America, the Philippines, India, Indonesia, and more. In addition to local original content, Superbook episodes and clips are shared in more than 60 languages and dialects. As Superbook continues to reach more children and families, testimonies of salvations and lives changed continue to grow. Well, you can find out more about what CBN is doing around the world by going to cbn.com slash international. When her daughter was born with a cleft palate, Nini was told that her baby would die. That's when she vowed to do everything in her power to keep her child alive. And she did. But it wasn't enough. The baby needed surgery that Nini and her husband could never afford. Mayo was born with a cleft palate. Sometimes when her mom, Nini, looked at her daughter, she remembered what the midwife said the day that Mayo was born. She said, my daughter would not survive. I promised myself that I would do everything I could to save her life. The doctor said she could have surgery when she turned one. So my husband and I decided to save her for the operation. Dan and Nini work in the rice fields in Myanmar. Nini also weaves mats to sell, but they earn just enough for the basics. 
I thought about working as a maid in the city. I couldn't bear the thought of leaving her. Mayo's big sister, Kayang, helps out when she can. It breaks my heart to see her cry. I play with her so she stops crying. Then one day, Nini heard about Operation Blessing. We then paid for Mayo to receive free surgery to repair her cleft palate. When she came out of surgery, I was really happy to see her. And Kayang was excited to see Mayo when she came home from the hospital. My sister's lip is so beautiful now. My heart is filled with happiness. Now, she is able to eat well. She likes looking at herself in the mirror and loves being with her friends. I never thought this day would come, but you make my dreams come true. Thank you. You know, in so many parts of the world, poverty brings with it hopelessness. And when I see these stories, I just can't help but think, as I'm sure you do, what an amazing thing it is to be able to just open up a whole new world to somebody who thought they had no options. 700 Club members, you do that every single day in many, many ways all around the world. To those of you who haven't joined yet, I know there are lots of you who watch the program, but maybe you've never gotten up to go to your phone and say, I want to join the 700 Club. You can join with the rest of us for 65 cents a day, $20 a month. It's so simple. Our number's toll free, 1-800-700-7000. Just want to encourage you to do that today because there are people that are waiting, just waiting for hope to come in to their impossible situation. And you and I have the privilege of bringing it. Lots of club levels for you to join at. I just told you about the general membership, but take a look at this. 700 Club Gold is a gift of $40 or more a month, or you can go to the 1,000 Club at $84 a month. 2,500 Club members join us, $209 a month. That bottom line, our founders join us at $5,000 a year. That works out to $417 a month. Ask God what he'd have you to do. And we want to say thank you to those of you who have joined and are joining by sending you Gordon's latest teaching, How to Believe for Healing. We've had such wonderful response to this. Jim from Lockport, New York says, How to Believe for Healing is one of the best explained teachings on healing I have ever heard. Gordon made it easy to understand the teaching and was well-rounded and straightforward with no magic magical formulas. And then Carol, who lives in Mount Union, Iowa, said, incredibly amazing. How to believe for healing arrived today. And in the past days, several health concerns gripped my heart. And it's as if God, as always, knew when I would read this. And I want you to know that how to believe for healing can be yours when you call. And it comes along with a handbook uh, for study of this subject. So we want you to have this. Most of all, we want you to stand with us in making a difference in the world. Go to your phone and call our number, one 800 700 7,000. Just say, I want to join the 700 Club. Gordon? Bobby was 16 years old when he was backing his car into his father's driveway. In an instant, Bobby's life was hanging by a thread, and his sister was dialing 911. 911? Oh, you report a crash. Um, I need an ambulance here. Someone there's an a, yeah, there's a boy. His head's got some blood in the back seat. The caller was 18-year-old Lexi Asa. The boy was her 16-year-old brother, Bobby. I don't know. I feel like I'm in so much shock. His eyes were completely closed. It literally looked like he was sleeping. Bobby was backing into their father's driveway when another car slammed into the driver's side. The impact was so violent. First responders found him in the back seat of the car. He was completely out. No response to pain. He wasn't moving any of his limbs. Over the years, seeing patients this badly injured, I didn't see how there could be a positive outcome. As Bobby was rushed to the nearest hospital, Lexi called her mother, Heather, who lives an hour away. You know, I'm. 45 minutes an hour away, sorry. And as you're driving, you're thinking of every one of your kids. Everything flashes before you. And I don't think anything else to do but pray. I mean, it was it's out of my hands. Heather and the rest of the family gathered at Legacy Emanuel Hospital in Portland, Oregon. There, they found Bobby in a coma and on a ventilator. An MRI confirmed he had suffered brain trauma and a broken neck. You, you almost feel like you're in a fog. You know, it's going in one ear and out the other. I don't know what it's like to lose a kid. I don't want to know. You know, I don't, I don't, I don't want to outlive my children. 
Doctors repaired Bobby's neck and took measures to reduce swelling on his brain, but gave the family little hope he would come out of his coma, assuming he survived. If he ever wakes up, he's going to be a quadriplegic. And we just sat there and cried. After eight days in ICU with no improvement, doctors told the family Bobby needed a tracheotomy. Some doctors advised to take Bobby off life support altogether. But they were just to the point, like, he's not moving, he's not responsive, he's not doing anything, he's going to be in a bed for the rest of his life. I remember going back to Bobby and just bawling. But a mother's heart sensed that this fight wasn't over. I don't want Bobby to be in a vegetative state for the rest of his life. That's not, there's no quality there. But I didn't feel that way. You know, I, I, I felt like Bobby was going to get better. I think that was the only prayer that I prayed. You know, I just, I just keep Bobby alive. So the family approved the tracheotomy. Afterwards, they, along with a large group of friends, held a prayer vigil outside the hospital. I had said down in, in the prayer vigil that, you know, I have to give it to God. And I, I hadn't done that yet. If it's not the time for you to go, then he's going to do awesome things. Bobby remained stable over the next several days, but still showed no signs of improvement. By now, a firestorm of prayer was sweeping through social media, his mother and three sisters refusing to leave his bedside. And I literally thanked God every single day for that Bobby's walking and talking like before. Thank you, Jesus, for the healing of Bobby's spine and brain. Thank you that he is walking and talking like before. Thank you, Jesus, that his memory is clear as day. I just thanked him for things I knew was, was to come. I were like, God, we need you. Like, we, I have nothing else. Like, Bobby is sleeping. Like, these people can't do anything for Bobby. We need you to start waking this kid up. Like, we need a miracle. At times, keeping hope alive was its own battle. I saw him, and I was like, God, why did you do this? Like, I just, I didn't see the light at the end of the tunnel. But the light would come. Bobby had been in the ICU two weeks when they started noticing small improvements. He would all of a sudden be like, you know, start moving his arm, or he'd move his elbow, or he would, you know, he'd turn his head. Anything, just a thumbs up. We're like, oh, thank you, God, yes. <laughs> we needed that thumbs up today. <laughs> it was a hard day, and we needed that thumbs up. Soon, they saw more signs of hope. We gave him a comb, and he went to go brush his hair. He's obsessed with his hair, so when we saw him do that, we're like, OK, that's Bobby. Bobby. That's not a reflex. By the end of four weeks, doctors were able to remove Bobby's trach tube and move him to rehab. Gradually, he came out of his coma. One day, he was finally able to speak. Mom was the first thing that he said, and they did work really hard on getting him to say mom, and I just started bawling. Bobby stayed in rehab for 10 weeks, building his strength and relearning the basics of life, like how to walk and feed himself. Every day was a new challenge, but he knew who could get him back. I was literally hanging by a thread. It was like so easy to break. But then God pulled it up, and therefore it turned into a rope, because now it's like I'm almost completely back to the same as it was. Bobby continues to get better and stronger. He and his family thank God for every new day. It just shows you that, like, prayer is not like some myth. Like, it works. He's a miracle worker. Like, he makes miracles, and he's a healer. I mean, I look at Bobby every day, and he is a walking, talking miracle. He should not be here. And if he is here, he shouldn't be knowing what he's doing. And it's incredible to think that God can take something and turn it around like that. He can take anything. He creates out of nothing. That's how powerful he is. He created everything. Go up and look at the stars, look at the sun, the moon, the stars, all the trees, all the gardens, this wonderful earth that we live on. He created it out of nothing. Now, that's how powerful he is. He can do anything. With God, all things are possible. I love the honesty of this story because they were wondering in the middle of the struggle, God, why did you allow this to happen? You, you can, you can, it's okay to complain to God. It's okay to pour out your complaint before him. That's what the Psalm says. But when you do it, get the revelation that he is not the author of what happened. He didn't drive that truck. He didn't T-bone anybody. 
in his, in his world, th this wouldn't have happened. This is why Jesus told us to pray in the Lord's Prayer. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. It's God, if God's will was always being done, we wouldn't be asked, Jesus wouldn't ask us to pray that. So start thinking about heaven. Is there anybody paralyzed? Is there anybody brain damaged? Is there anybody T-bowing anybody? Is there anybody lonely? Is there anybody sick? Is there anything like that at all? And the answer is no. That doesn't happen when God's will is in place. Now, here's the best news. You and I, as ambassadors of the King of Kings, as ambassadors of the kingdom of heaven, we are authorized by Jesus Christ to declare the kingdom of heaven is drawn near to you. God's will is getting ready to be done in your life. He is ready, willing, and able to heal you, to restore you, to create something out of nothing. He's able to do all of that. We're authorized to do this. Now, here's a lesson from that story. How did they pray heaven down? They gave thanks in advance of the miracle. They started thanking very specifically, Lord, I thank you that Bobby's able to do and fill in the blank. Lord, I, I thank you. Now, now start doing that over yourself. Lord, I thank you that you're enabling me to do and name what it is you want. Isn't that wonderful? We get to pray heaven down. We get to pray that his will would be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now, this isn't something where, you know, I thank you for the big mega yacht. No, he doesn't want that for you. That's, you can't claim that that's God's will for you. But you can claim healing. You can claim provision. You can claim deliverance. You can claim restoration of relationship. You can claim that his love would flow out of you. You can claim all of those things. When you find it in Scripture, claim it. All the promises of God are yes and amen for those who are in Christ Jesus. That's you. So we're going to pray for you right now. In advance, start thanking him for the solution. Thank him for the answer. And then heaven will come to you and God's will would be done in your body today. Let's pray. Lord God Almighty, we come to you and we know that you are the one who is able to create out of nothing. That is by the power of your word, you speak things into existence. So Lord, I thank you for the healing that you are providing and that you have provided for by your stripes, we are healed. I thank you for it. I thank you for the financial provision that you're providing for your people in need. You provide all our need according to your riches and glory. I thank you for the restoration of relationships, the restoration of children to parents, parents to children. I thank you for it. Lord, heal, deliver, restore, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Terry, God's given you something. Yeah, there's someone you have a, um, you've had some kind of cranium issue, uh, some kind of surgery on your skull, and there are some issues related to your healing with that. God's healing that for you right now. Just feel that warmth kind of wrap itself, radiate around the, the top of your head. Someone else, it's April, but you live in an area where there's snow. You've had a snow-related injury. That's how You're having a hard time with its healing. God's healing that for you right now. Just begin to thank him and, and lift your hands and praise him. There's someone you're suffering with uh, ulcerated colitis, um, and God's just delivering you from all of that, and he's completely healing your digestive system. I don't know if it's the same person, but there's someone you have just dramatic pain in the lower left side uh, below your stomach. God is healing your entire intestine from um, beginning to end. Everything is being restored. That pain just left you now. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Give thanks to the Lord. Tell of his good works. Call us, 1-800-700-7000 if you need prayer. We're here for you 24 hours a day. All you have to do is call. 
Here's a word from Psalms. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the one who takes refuge in him.